Good evening, everyone. My name is Barry Murphy, and I'm the Communications Officer for BodyWise, the Eating Disorder Association of Ireland. And you're all very welcome to this evening's webinar based on autism and eating disorders. We have a range of speakers tonight, and I want to thank them all for giving up the, of their time, experience, knowledge this evening. And I hope it's a useful and productive event for everyone who attends. My thanks also to the special interest group in eating disorders and the special interest group in autism in the Psychological Society of Ireland. Tonight's event con consists of a series of pre-recorded and live presentations. You can please submit your questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. At the end, later this evening, we will have a live panel discussion uh, we will not be able to respond to any raised hands, so please use the Q&A function. If you're tweeting, please use the hashtag EDAW2021 and make sure you tag us at BodyWise, at PSI Autism SIG and at PS SIG ED. If you require CPT, B, CPT points for this evening, please contact autism at psychologicalsociety.ie. For me, this event has been quite long in the making, dating back to approximately September, October. And behind that, my own interest in the area started a few years ago, just by the very nature of some of the calls and emails that BodyWise was getting from parents and people with personal experience of autism and eating disorders. So that's the rationale for why this event is on tonight. And I hope you find it very informative. I'm now pleased to hand over to our chair, Dr. Faye Murphy, who is going to introduce you to the first two speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. My name is Dr. Faye Murphy. I'm principal psychologist in Lucina Cams, and I'm delighted to welcome our first two speakers this evening, Fiona fisher Bullivant and Charlene Woods. Um, Fee, Fiona, also known as Fee, as a, uh, um, and her author name is Fiona Fisher Bullivant, as a thank you to her parents, as her maiden name was Fisher. She's been a learning disability nurse for 36 years, which I find difficult to believe, but looking at you now, Fiona. Uh, she trained at the Royal Albert School of Nursing in Lancaster in Cumbria in England. Fiona's career has spanned many different therapeutic settings, but mainly community. And apart from one position, her entire career has been with children and young people. She has worked in many different parts of the UK and even in the USA for a short period early on in her career. Fee has worked for many years with young people with complex learning and physical needs and young people with autism within, within community learning disability teams. After a restructuring in services, she found herself in a complex needs team within a CAM service about 15 years ago. And since then, she's had a special interest in the function of behaviour and the impact of sensory integration and processing on mental health. Her specialist area of work is with young women with autism who have additional needs in relation to their emotional well-being and their mental health. Her co-presenter is Charlene Woods who is a, a registered advanced dietitian working in the field of child and adolescent eating disorders since 2015 in the NHS. And Charlene is a co-author of Autism and Eating Disorders in Teens, a guide for parents and professionals with Fiona. Charlene has worked across a variety of clinical settings, adult and paediatric, and has also worked in medical laboratory diagnostics. She adapts a holistic approach to individualised nutrition and places value in putting the young person at the centre of their own care. Despite being an introvert by nature, it's not unusual to see her challenging the wider systems and their culture to ensure that we provide the right care for that person. Um, she has a special interest in the impact of diet culture on our relationship with food and our bodies and is also curious about the link between autism and eating disorders. I'm absolutely dying to hear your presentation. I don't mean to be rude, but I'll give you a two minute warning just before the end to let you know to wrap up. OK, hand over now. Thank you, Faye. Um, just get our presentation up. Okay, so as Faye says, uh, my name is Charlene. I'm uh, a dietitian uh, working in um, child and adolescent um, eating disorders. And I'll just get Fiona to briefly mention herself. 
Hi, so I'm Fee Bullivant um, and I'm currently working as an advanced nurse practitioner in the CAM service um, alongside Charlie. Um, so just before we start our presentation, we just want to say that um, our presentation and our book is basically about our personal experience um, of working within and across each of our respective areas. Um, and what that means is that uh, or knowledge is based on the young people that we've worked with. And we're very aware that there may be some bias um, involved in that because most of our um, findings is with young people who've got restrictive um, eating disorders and that doesn't incorporate kind of all the other types of eating disorders. And even this week's theme of eating disorder awareness next week is um, binge eating disorder. Uh, and it's not something I actually see in eating disorder service. And I know that there needs to be more awareness around that, but I also know that it's not that it's something that possibly people with autism are actually experiencing as well. Um, Fiona and I are really strong on the fact that we continue to learn and develop. We don't really see ourselves as experts. Um, we could never argue that we're experts in other people's lives and experiences, but we're really curious about other people's lives and experience, and that's what we're, we're really passionate about. To just give a little bit of background on what we're going to cover today, um, there is going to be, I'll kind of glance over the slide about research because I know that there's going to be covered by other people within um, today's webinar. Uh, the challenges, some of the early identifications, because a lot of people come to our services with an eating disorder, but then we later find out that actually autism is at play. And we'll discuss about therapy and intervention, how one size does not fit all. We'll also um, talk about recovery and understanding of self, also other areas of consideration, and we'll have a brief conclusion at the end as well. I'll just briefly go over this because I'm sure it will cover it elsewhere. Um, and it just kind of covers that there is kind of evidence to suggest that um, a lot of people who um, come to eating disorder services may have um, non-recognized autism as well. Um, and it's poorly understood, especially in females. And this is Fiona's kind of ex kind of area she's really passionate about, about how autism actually presents differently in young females and women, and that most of the research is done in boys, and actually girls are not boys, naturally enough, um, so therefore their presentation may look a little bit different. Uh, so one of the challenges in terms of identifying autism is the trip versus state conundrum, and that just means that whenever a young person is starved or malnourished, um, they will um, present as obsessional, rigid, and also lack um, kind of social communication skills. And therefore, it can be very difficult to use just a creative impairment in order to kind of identify autism. And Fiona will be going through kind of what other areas alongside that can help you do that, that diagnosis. We also know very much so in females and um, also and possibly in some males as well, is that um, they mask which means in kind of social situations, they put on a face is what often young people will tell me. They will pretend to be like their other friends. They will pretend to have the same interests. And that's the same when they come to our services. Um, they feel that they have to say things or they have to report things because then that means that they will fit in. We also have to be very conscious of our kind of social conditioning and diet culture, which is basically is one of my passions. Everywhere you go and every, everything that you see um, is about diets and making ourselves smaller and what's healthy and what's not healthy. And actually that will impact people who've got kind of obsessional traits. So we have to be very careful of our language. Um, one of the things that we definitely find in the work that we do is about practitioner and knowledge and training. Um, and it's also one of my passions. So people, as I would always say, we, you don't know what you don't know we always have to be really curious about those things instead of being scared of them. Um, I know as a dietitian, um, I got very, very, very little knowledge, like, training on eating disorder and absolutely no training on autism. Uh, so that's very difficult to kind of enter that clinical phase when you feel that you don't actually have the skill set to do that. And something that we very much want to advocate across kind of all healthcare courses. In terms of our services, actually me and Fiona only met because of um, an office briefer. We actually didn't know they all existed before that. And we then had to um, kind of cram into a kitchen while our office spaces got like kept out with new desks and stuff. 
Um, and that's how I came to know about Fiona. And we got actually into discussions and realized actually maybe there's a role for each other in each of our respective areas. So actually we need to source out these people. We need to have conversations um, and that we will actually enhance patient care when we do that. I'll have, pass over to Fiona. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk in detail about a couple of the um, parts of the slide, but um, just to really say that if we could, if we could really find our young people a lot sooner, um, that would be the the main goal, really. But unfortunately, we're still not in that position um, to kind of find. Um, our young people that say at three, four, five years old, um, but when we do come into contact with them, so when they come into our services, that's what we mean by early identification. So what we know is that um, we, in order to kind of support those young people and do the best that we can for them clinically, we need to do um, a really thorough developmental history as soon as they come into us. Now, I'm going to go on the next slide and, and talk in, you know, in some detail about a developmental history. Um, we also really need to know about their sensory needs. Um, and then something I kind of get into um, discussions with, with discussions in with um, some of the other um, clinical clinicians within the team is about the cognitive and communication difficulties so I'm very passionate that we look at all areas we look holistically at our young people and that means also cognitively um, and that and in relation to their communication styles and difficulties and um, what I mean by that is that we do know that even our what we would have classed um, as our very intelligent very cognitively cognitively able young people and um, they may have very specific learning different styles or learning difficulties and often really mask those in the educational settings. So when they come to um, GCSEs and um, any kind of assessments, it can be really, really hard for them because they will have found systems and strategies, but actually the teachers may not even know that they're really struggling. Um, and that can be even, you know, some kind of things in relation to um, how things are worded. So sometimes when math starts to change in terms of having lots more language around it and stuff, then that could come, you know, become difficult for some of our young people. So um, I, I really, you know, think that we really need to look at cognitive styles and that often causes some quite um, lengthy discussions with the educational psychology teams and the, and the clinical psychology team members because, um, as to why we would need to do that with quite a lot of our young people, especially if they're really bright and they've got A stars, et cetera. Why would we need to do that? Um, but because of those real nuances and those real um, real subtle differences often, often that we might think are subtle, but actually would, would cause a young person to really become really quite anxious about um, and not perhaps fulfill um, and be the best they can be. So that's really, really important. Um, and same with having you know, speech and language assessments as well um, in terms of how they maneuver and negotiate um, conversations and relationships around conversations. Um, and then I'm gonna leave the last one for um, Charlene because that's her kind of thing, the relationship with food. So in terms of developmental history, um, this is the, for me, this is the most, significant and fundamental thing we need to do because a bit when Charlene was talking about you know the kind of conundrum between um you know trait versus state what we do know is if we do a really good developmental history we will see characteristics of autism pre any kind of eating um disorder um, so it will show us that things were happening before these young people have, have come to us. Um, so it's really, really important because you can then sift out social communication difficulties, sensory difficulties, etc. So it's absolutely fundamental. And I know as a clinician and I've been around for such a long time that I know we still don't do that really well. Or if we do, there's different ways of doing it from the different clinical backgrounds. So we need more of kind of um, a formula really for, for doing that so that we ask the right questions um, and we ask we layer the questions I think that's a really important thing to say as well is it's not just about you know asking those questions about early development or sleep or whatever it's layering down so if I can give an example of um so for example sleep you know 
we as clinicians we we should know about those real mile, milestones that children um, should reach at what ages etc and um, so we know children should start to sleep at a certain age and how do they sleep how do they self-soothe etc but if you've got um a parent who is saying oh no they didn't sleep or um what what needs to happen is why why was there um, difficulties? Explain those difficulties. And what did you have to do to help your young person to sleep? Um, what had to be put in place? And then you start to build up a picture of actually, this looks really quite different to another child of that developmental stage. So what was going on for that young person? You know, why couldn't they self-soothe? Why couldn't they settle? What was it about? Um, the same with eating and drinking, you know, I don't know, Charlene's going to talk about this a little bit further on, but what was their eating and drinking like? You know, did they transition um, from breast to bottle? If they were bottle fed, did they have to have particular teats? Could they only have one kind of teat? Did it have to be a different specialist kind of teat? Um, how did they transition then onto solids? You know, was there any gagging there? Was there any textural issues, um, any vomiting or anything? At those stages in those early development, developmental years that can give us some more clues as to something else was going on at that time. Um, we talked a little bit about self-soothing in sleep, but self-soothing in general. Um, how did they manage their emotions when they were little? How did they cope with things and and self-regulate? Um, again, you can mark them against the you know developmental milestones, and if it's it, it it can start to look unusual or or different. So again, it'll get starting to build up those layers of a picture. Friendships and relationships is always one that parents. Um, will often initially say to us, actually, that was fine. At primary school, they had a best friend. They had a little circle of, of friends and they were really great. Got to year six, it started getting a bit dodgy. And then actually, then it just kind of started deteriorating into high school. But what I would be saying is, why was it OK in primary school? What, what do you mean by they had friendships? What was the flavour and the quality of the best friend? Could they accept other people joining into their little group? What was it about those individuals that, that was OK in that small group? Um, did they play alongside or did they, did they mother? Did they copy? And, and to really break that down, because I think we really lose some vital bits of information about friendships and relationships because for parents often it looks quite okay but when we look back and we kind of layer it down you can start to see that there were some difficulties there um, but they weren't impacting I guess that's really important to say they might not have impacted at that age but they were there and they give us clues to where we we are now with our young people um, language and communication again you know really think about were they um was your child, um, gen, you know, in all general kind of settings, able to um, converse with different kinds of people? Did they show an interest in other people or did they just want to talk about the things that they liked? Um, you know, was there lovely reciprocity there, even from quite a young age of, you know, how are you, mummy, today? How do you feel today? Or rather, was it quite stilted when it came to that kind of sharing of information and being interested in other people's information. Um, so often the, the motivation and the interest is there, it's just the ability to be able to ask and know what to ask and to then feed back and to do that kind of to in and fro in, which is, it's almost like a dance, isn't it, in, in, a, in a conversation. Um, so again, you know, really have a think about that. When they were little, you know, could they could they have a conversation with you? W would they ask you how you are and really mean it? Or did it feel a little bit stilted? Um, empathy, we know, you know, there used to be a myth that um, people with autism didn't have empathy. What we know now is that, um, you know, um, it's of, of course empathy is there, but it's how uh, young people express that, understand it, manage it, process it. So again, it might look like it's not there, but it might just be that they're overwhelmed or or just cannot explain or describe how to um, how to manage a situation where they need to be empathic. Often we find that our young people are over empathic and really kind of are saturated with other people's feelings, thoughts, actions, and can't manage them as well as their own and then kind of negotiate around that. Um, Behaviour, again, if you um, really kind of like go back to the early years, 
ask about things like, you know, what were the tantrums like? You know, how long did they last? Did the normal parental kind of ways of managing them work? Did, um, and if not, what did you have to do? And how did you work around it? Um, and what was the behaviour communicating at that time? Did you ever kind of work it out? Did you know what, um, why your child was distressed, but perhaps in social settings or around sensory times? Um, you know, and how, how did they manage it themselves? Uh, what was different? Often, you, you know, you'll get a lot of, um, a lot of parents going, I, we just, we just had to do things differently than we did with our other children. Um, and we, we just didn't know why, you know, we were parenting, we'd done really well with our other children, we didn't know why it was different. So look at the kind of behaviours and what they're telling, um, what they told you and what, when they happened. Um, Again, to think about when children play and when you're watching them and when they're growing up, did um, was there any kind of thought that there was a, um, that they used to get stuck in rituals or were quite obsessional in the way that they were thinking and behaving and kind of conversing about that as well? You know, did things become overwhelming? Could things be moved in their rooms? Could um, could you go out unexpectedly or receive people into the house unexpectedly without a, you know, a, 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 a real meltdown, etc. You know, was any of that present at all? Now, often we get with the young, um, when we're talking about our young women, um, they'll say that, oh yeah, you know, they had, they collected loads of dolls or they collected loads of stuffed animals. And often we get kind of sidetracked as clinicians and think, well, that's actually what most kids do you know did the little boys line up the the trains did they put them in a car park and again don't stop there ask and layer it down you know was it that you could interrupt that is it that you could um uh change any of that could you move things um so really kind of look at that kind of behavior and it's a similar thing to the collecting you know did it did it become very intense? What was the quality of the collecting? You know, as children, everything I remember, you know, it was really, you know, at the time it was stamp collecting or um, you went and collected pebbles or something. But there's a difference between doing that developmentally at the right developmental stages and actually then it becoming more intense and it impacting on your emotional state um, and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, how were they with, with transitions? How did they um, manage going from school year to school year? How did they manage you leaving them at the school gate? Um, how did they cope with going to high school? Um, all very important things. How did they cope with generic transitions of um, unexpected transitions as well? So um, actually, we're just going to go out now and we're going to go and see grandma um, without a plan in place. Um, and how did they manage that? What did you see? Um, which kind of kind of leads into separation as well. You know, was was there a difficulty with separating at like the the gate to going into school? Did they need transitional objects all the time um, in order for them to be to manage that separation? And if so, again, what were they and what was the purpose of them? And did it shift and change into other things? Are they still needing prompts and props to transition? um just by using other things so i guess the you know i've said it quite a few times the thing is don't just stop at the normal questions dig deep and ask lots of questions and be really um charlene likes to say be really curious i say nosy um <laughs> curious is much better um so if we go into sensory um in terms of our young people with autism, we know, well, we're all sensory beings, um, but we know that often they are significantly impacted on by the way that they understand, interpret, um, and communicate how they are experiencing their sensory world. So whether they um, are under aroused and need more stimulation or over aroused and need to just have everything calm down and that can fluctuate with all of us. Um, so sensory diets are really important. Sen I, I would say as well as the developmental history, knowing um, your young person and how their sensory world impacts on them is, is the other very vital thing. Um, we know that um, if your sensory world isn't okay, then your emotional well-being and your emotional self-regulation will be impacted on. Um, and so if we can kind of get that right and understand a bit of that, we're going to help the other bit. So again, it's, it, it is like a piece of a jigsaw. 
<coughs> if we get the information from all these different parts, we're more likely to get a really good picture of what's going on for that person, that individual, and know then what to do about it in the right way with the right strategies. So um, another one that I know Charlene comes across quite a lot is, you know, this feeling full all the time, not not knowing, not wanting really to eat um, because not feeling hungry. Um, and on the flip side, not knowing when to stop eating and um, just not getting those kind of signals. Um, and if you think about a sensory kind of environment, meal times are horrendous, really, aren't they? Because there's often a few people, few people, you often don't eat on your own. There's normally other external environmental noises and stuff. You know, there can be ovens and other people cooking. There'll be people talking, there'll be smells, there'll be textures, there'll be expectations of how long the meal should normally last. And there will be differences in that. So it could be very unexpected, um, unpredictable. Um, even how the food looks on the plate, how it's situated, um, how you're expected to sit and eat properly with a knife and fork rather than perhaps move around and eat with your fingers or graze during the day. So mealtime environments, if you are struggling with your sensory processing and interpretation, are, are literally like a nightmare. So I'll hand over to Charlene now remember to unmute myself. Um, so I suppose in terms of relationship with food and weight, um, things that I kind of tend to do as a dietitian is kind of some of the things that Fiona's already kind of covered, um, but we do a really kind of detailed kind of history in terms of birth uh, and like feeding, if they were breastfeed, how was it kind of latching, um, also bottle feeding, how was that? Um, and also in terms of the the weaning as well did we transition to kind of weaning foods um okay was that there was there any issues um we also cover kind of preferred foods and reason why um we have to really get as you want to say nosy or i say curious about preferred foods so what we have to understand is that some parents will all say yeah no issues there's not a problem yeah they kind of transitioned well down to that but we have to really understand that family culture around food because actually within every family we have a different kind of culture and relationship with food and so whenever we hear those words we hear our own narratives so we have to be really kind of dig deep about the questioning actually what is those what is that culture what does that look like what does meal times look like do you have a set menu every week because actually some families have bolognese monday or pizza tuesdays and actually then that means that that young person knows what's happening and is expecting that and therefore there's no changes and so the anxiety stays quite low um, so it's important to kind of really dig deep in terms of preferred foods and the reasons why as well as the culture and tradition within those families as Fiona's already said in terms of sensory and the reason that we really need to kind of look at that sometimes um, we see young people and we explore do you feel hungry um, and they go no never um, but we actually don't really explore the history of that hunger actually have they ever felt hunger or do they just are in a routine and they just eat because a meal is put in front of them but as they get older and parents are having this expectation that you need to be more independent about feeding yourself they actually don't get the cues and they were like, but oh, what's the big deal? I'm, I'm not actually hungry. So why would I go and seek something out? Um, but some of our young people, if you place the food right in front of them, they would actually eat it. Um, there's also kind of the um, gastrointestinal kind of sensory things. So a lot of young people on eating disorders do feel full um, whenever you're on a refeeding. But actually for some people with autism, that distress is really high because of the actual the refeeding, the actual biological kind of eating is really um, distressing and can cause meltdowns and um, we also need to be careful about how we question um, our young people because I know it's like, oh do you vomit and I've had young people go yes um, and actually then we just kind of imply well actually they make themselves sick but actually young people may actually feel so overwhelmed by the um, sensory kind of process of eating that actually they kind of vomit Kind of spontaneously and we really need to kind of think about those questions that we're asking um, so we also in terms of what we do find is kind of young people with autism they kind of move with their special interests so you can look at their kind of developmental history have they ever been really interested in things um, and actually there is a difference kind of then between the preoccupation around food which we get whenever we're starved 
and we always think about food actually where can we get food it's kind of a human nature response versus actually whenever they do even kind of get better um is that special interest still around um do they still really like baking all those things it's kind of distinguishing between the two also exploring the context of their behaviors um, and the reason I say this is because sometimes we weigh young people and they go, oh, I'm happy that the number's gone down on the scales. And so then we interpret that as, oh, they're happy to get, lose weight and they don't want to gain weight. And actually what we find is some people actually just like the number going down. It's nothing to do with how they see themselves in terms of weight or shape. It's about the obsessionality around numbers. And that can also imply in terms of when you calorie count. Uh, so with my young people who don't have autism, I don't actually advocate calorie counting because it actually builds into that rigidity. But with some of my young people who have had autism, actually calorie counting actually got them back to a better place in terms of their health. So we really have to do that individualized approach and kind of sift out actually is autism here and actually would that be better for them to calorie count. Um, with Neve, who was in our book, um, she had she made the choice to be vegan, and that's something we have to really question within our field and eating disorders. Is actually this a restrictive practice in order to lose weight, or is actually this something that they're really passionate about? And with Neve, something felt very different in the room with me, and I was a very amateur, amateur young eating disorder dietitian at the time, and my gut it was kind of like, well, I'm not supposed to allow her to be vegan. Um, but actually something felt very different. And I said, okay, let's go with it. And actually for her, that really promoted good health for her. And she came in with all these wonderful vegan recipes and she got a lot better on actually being vegan because she was actually passionate about the kind of animal rights, all those things. And actually we went with that special interest of hers in it and she got better. Um, it's also exploring the language again. As you, if you know me, language is my thing. We really have to listen to our young people. There is a difference between I feel fat and I do not want to be fat. Um, so usually with their young people who have autism, they actually can see themselves and they don't see themselves as fat, but actually they hear the other, their peers, all of this is our common everyday language. If we want to annoy another young person, we call them fat, unfortunately. So we really have to be curious about the language that they're saying. They are saying, I do not want to be fat. Um, and they might say, I feel fat, um, but we really have to unpick it because do they see themselves as fat? There is a difference there. So it's about asking what they see in the mirror when they look in themselves. Do you see how you look? And usually you will find like, oh no, I, I know I'm not fat. Uh, so it's really important to kind of unpick that language. Do you want There we go. Sorry, mute on mute. It's going to be something that stays with us forever, isn't it? Um, therapy interventions. So, oh gosh, this is um, this is a biggie, isn't it? So, we know one size doesn't fit all. Um, we have to really think flexibly as clinicians. We have to know our young people. So we've got to have done that really good assessment of our young people. We've got to build that therapeutic relationship up with them. And then we've got to think, right, what is the, the best thing, the best way to do um, the work with them, you know, collaboratively and, and in a, a very helpful way to enable them to change um, in a positive way. Um, and so it has to be holistic, it has to be multifaceted. So using one modality is not just, is not gonna work. So if, if we've got somebody who's really struggling um, with, if you think about what we've talked about already, that they may be um, struggling with sensory processing, they may be struggling with some kind of um, understanding or learning or processing. Um, they may have um, obviously difficulties with their social communication. You can't just then go, okay, so we see that there's an obsessional kind of trait here, so we're going to go down a route to say CBT, um, or we're going to go down a route of just systemic, or we're going to go down a route of psychotherapeutic. Um, it really doesn't work um, for, our, for our people with autism. And if you've ever seen anything from, uh, you know, or read anything from, from Tony Atwood, you'll know that um, 
he he dis, he talks about this all the time as well that one modality is not the way to go with our young people with autism and it and it isn't helpful so we've got to you know really think of that um eclectic kind of way of of working with our young people but also being consistent and and doing it in a way that um is helpful to them so um we need to know where it's sorry charlene is it <laughs> you just go back a second <laughs> got excited there um we need to um think about the function um where where is this coming from so again a bit like the developmental history really peeling back you know what's the history behind this when did it start kind of why do we think it started um and and what's the reason for it what is it doing for this young person so start to kind of understand where it's coming from um, and to understand how they communicate that as well to you again like Charlene says you know we really need to listen more I don't think you know as clinicians you know over the years we think that we do that but actually sometimes we get stuck in a way and we're quite rigid we get stuck in a way of how we work and how we are supposed to deliver interventions and we lose sight of actually we should be the ones shifting we should be the ones moving we should be the ones that are enabling our young people and and learn about them as people not just as conditions and diagnosis that actually we are working with people and we need to understand them as a person in order to kind of move us forward with this so again when we're thinking about um a holistic approach we need to be thinking about um multi-agency so we're talking again about speech and language therapy we're talking about um occupational therapy we're talking about educational psychology, clinical psychology, dietetics, um, you know, it's it's a huge kind of, this is why it gets really difficult because often people say, well, you can't have that many people involved in, in some person's um, therapeutic journey. But actually, if you're, if you're skilled enough, you will get all that information, but then you will dip in and out for that young person and you will watch and, and see what's working and what's not. And you will you will use different people at different times. Consistent people is always <coughs> very good. So one, I never say one alone, one or two, so that you can switch in and out. And so they get used to as well that, you know, if anybody's ever off or um is poorly or whatever there's another person or there are other people around that can continue with the work there needs to be a team a real wraparound um all of you understanding the young person and all of you approaching it in the same way um and that goes with like the um the assessments and all the interventions the therapeutic relationship is imperative and again don't be frightened to say to, to explore why it might not be working you know we're all individuals sometimes we get on better with other people than we do others um just to say that you have to see this person um is it can be really really difficult but as a clinician you you can say i don't think this is working and and why is it not and explore that you know you don't need to give up on it but explore what it is and and change it in a a, a way you know in a way that's going to be helpful in discussions with your young person and their families and um, if it's still not working don't be frightened to say then we need to think of something else or we need to change it or we need to switch it up don't be frightened to do that sticking with something and just slogging it is not going to be helpful to anybody so right, you've got to have a two minute warning there oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> um okay so time really important um we need more time not to be rushed through um our work we need to share and work together and we need to work collaboratively with our young people and we need to enter their world and work flexibly um i will i suppose uh, in terms of kind of briefly go on this um diagnosis and labels are great for us as clinicians um, but not sometimes great for our young people. Um, it's all dependent. So we, again, you have to have that discussion with your young person on whether they think they will benefit from a label. So a lot of our young people, we may suspect autism and they think themselves, but they don't want to go through the process of actually that diagnostic criteria. So again, having that kind of um, conversation. And always remember it's recovery in the context of the eating disorder. We do not say that we recover from autism. That's a part of who they are. Um, and we also need to kind of change our communication on how we kind of um, kind of express ourselves with these people and they shouldn't have to change to meet our needs. Um, so that will, I'll skip the need of coaching, you could 
higher but couldn't see those quotes. There is also consider all the other different kind of comorbidities that come in as well. And indeed, the biggest task is our service and culture change. And as often as individuals, we feel that we can't do that. But I actually say the individual voice can be really powerful. Um, and as I say, I'm an introvert by nature. I love my quiet time, but actually <laughs> in the workplace, and I'm sure if my colleagues are on this webinar, they'll know that I speak and advocate quite loudly um, for our young people and for our service and what we deliver. Just a kind of a conclusion and for professionals and parents, um, but my overall take home is always going to be this. Please remain curious um, if you're working with anybody that has an eating disorder and may have autism as well. It's really important. You, you may have your structures and your kind of your assessment performance and all those things, but don't be scared to go off them. Um, let them lead you in terms of their conversations. Yes, I know time is, is of an essence at the moment in terms of how we do these things. Actually, our young people, or if these people are having difficulties, they're just as important. And, and it's important that we get that right first time round. I don't know what Fee's final advice is. Um, final advice is be brave, um, be flexible, keep learning and challenge your colleagues. Fantastic. Thank you both very much. Amazing timekeeping. Perfect. Right on the button. Um, thank you both very much. And we look forward to hearing more about from both of you in the panel discussion. Um, I'd now like to present Madeline Oakley, who's going to give us a carer's perspective. Madeline is a senior teaching fellow in mental health studies at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience in King's College, London. She previously ran the MSc in Family Therapy and MSc in Mental Health Studies programme, both at the IO both at the IOP. Uh, a UK CP registered psychotherapist since 1993, Madeline originally trained in psychoanalytic psychotherapy. This was followed by a training as a systemic family systemic therapist in the Institute of Psychiatry in 1994 to 95. Madeline's clinical experience has been in the NHS, working with children and families in adolescent eating disorders at the Maudsley Hospital, the voluntary sector, working as a clinical supervisor of counsellors in the field of bereavement and in infertility counselling at University College Hospital. Madeline has co-authored two interdisciplinary research papers on autism and learning disabilities. She's the parent and carer of a young man with autism and a learning disability, and she's the carer ca champion on the Peace Pathway project. Madeline's current research investigates psychoeducational support for carers of family members with concurrent autism and eating disorders and concurrent autism and psychosis. You're very welcome, Madeline. Hand over to you. Thanks very much, Faye. Um, well, hi, everybody. Uh, I need to share my screen, but I just thought I'd say hello. And um, as you heard, I'm a carer and I was initially a clinician. So I made a journey from clinician to carer. So I'll try, try and share my screen now and hope that that all works. Okay, is that all right, everybody see? Lovely, so I really just um, started in the field of research about carers and um, I'm looking at the field of um, carers of people with autism and eating disorders and autism and psychosis. But this presentation is about autism and eating disorder carers. Uh, just trying to move this slide. Okay, it's not moving. Okay, my slides are stuck, unfortunately. So, okay, here we are. Good, that's better. So, um, so yeah, this is a book uh, It's just come out uh, 18th of March, actually, uh, edited by Kate Tanchuria. And um, <clears throat> she is my supervisor and I'm in her lab, which is called the Peace Pathway. And that's about um, creating uh, a sort of clinical pathway for people who have autism and eating disorders. And um, the team has written a book about it. I've got a chapter in this book. Basically, um, it's about... My, my own journey, making the mental transition from clinician to carer. And what I found very helpful was knowing about the importance of expressed emotion. So um, I'm not gonna actually talk about that today. I'm gonna present some more recent research, but um, just in a nutshell, I think there's a sort of paradox because 
carers need to be emotionally over-involved uh, by the nature of the complicated problems of the person that they're looking after. So it's this kind of involvement is very necessary for them to be able to deal with statutory processes of getting proper diagnoses and dealing with services, sometimes even legal processes in order to get EHCPs. But um, I do think that um, lower expressed emotion, lower over-involvement, emotional over-involvement helps both carers and the people they're caring for. So if you want to read more about that, um, I've got a chapter there. Okay, so um, basically uh, my research is looking at um, carers of people with autism and eating disorders, but just by coincidence, it actually started um, at the same time as the first UK lockdown, so in March 2020. So um, this was a kind of coincidence, but I guess it's worked into this piece of research. Um, so just from my point of view as a carer, um, you know, I've got a 23 year old son with autism and learning disability, and he lives in supported living. But um, I remember that him and all the people he shared the house with, they accepted the sort of restrictions quite obediently um, initially. But now a year on and two further lockdowns on, most of them have developed, I think, new mental and physical health problems. So I think the family carers have had to become more involved with their loved ones to keep them try and help them keep stable psychologically and physically. So I guess my point is once you're an autism parent or carer, you always will be, as everyone knows, it's a lifelong neurodevelopmental condition. And there are kind of challenges at every different life cycle stage. So uh, mentioned the peace pathway. So this is led by Kate Tanchuria. And I think I told you what PEACE stands for, but I'll tell you again, it's the pathway for eating disorders and autism developed from clinical experience. So um, sufferers of concurrent autism and eating disorders make up at least 35% of all sufferers of anorexia. So that's quite a huge statistic. And so carers of family members with this comor comorbidity will, will chase, face challenges at all life cycle stages. Now, the background is, uh, the team, including myself, uh, produced a paper last year. It was really the first paper looking at carers' views, um, carers of people with autism and eating disorders. So it gave a sort of snapshot um, of some of the current issues facing carers. And, um, you know, what we found was that they felt isolated. They felt that services didn't understand the sort of complicated uh, nature of the uh, comorbidity that their sort of children were suffering from. And I guess that original paper suggested that, um, you know, uh, specially tailored support would help their children, um, but also for them themselves as carers. So um, using the same questionnaire, which was asking about um, carers' experiences of getting assessments and help for their children and themselves, um, I did a second round of interviews, so I didn't do the first round, but the thing about the second round, I guess it was it's called peer-led because it was done by myself, so I'm an autism family carer. Um, with this piece of research, we um, engaged fathers and male sufferers of autism, and I guess the other novel thing, like I said, it was conducted during the first late UK lockdown, the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, the initial aim was to find out what the support, further find out what the support needs were of carers. And um, I think what I found after doing the first two interviews that um, people were really suffering, the carers were really suffering because um, services had suddenly been sort of uh, suspended, disrupted, um, or gone on to Zoom or the phone, and this has had a real impact on them and, uh, and uh, the people they looked after. So they were really um, quite in distress uh, at the beginning of this pandemic. Uh, so I'm sure you will remember there's a lot of uncertainty. What's this going to look like? How long is it going to last for? So, you know, if you think about that, um, a lot of inpatient services were closed. So children, adult children were sent home to their parents and so on. Okay, so um, after doing the first two interviews, like I said, um, 
I set up an online support group because I was so moved by what they'd said. And this ran weekly from <clears throat> May until December last year, where carers could sort of meet each other and share experiences. So I think you all know that there's a significant body of literature already on for carers of people just with eating disorders and what helps, but uh, there's very little on carers of people with comorbid eating disorders and autism. So um, as previous speakers mentioned so well, um, people with autism and eating disorders will suffer from um, additional issues such as sensory issues, which could motivate food restriction, uh, might be difficulties engaging with treatments due to communication differences, and maybe more cognitive rigidity, making it more difficult to change eating disorder related behaviors and conditions. And I think this produces additional stresses for the carers. Um, you know, um, I guess typically uh, people with autism have more problems at every stage of the life cycle. Um, and have uh, certainly children, uh, it's well documented, have uh, temper tantrum, self-harm, aggression to the self and self-stimulation. Not, not all children, but many children with autism. So I guess my point is that parents caring for a child with autism are likely to experience additional challenges that won't be experienced by parents who just have a child with an eating disorder. Um, so we used a qualitative design uh, having semi-structured um, interview uh, with carers of people with diagnosis of eating disorder and autism. So we asked the carers about their experiences of getting assessments and help for their children and their experiences of getting help as carers themselves. And finally, any improvements in services that they would recommend for their loved ones and for themselves as carers. So um, a total of 11 carers participated in the interviews. Um, Four carers were accessed via SLAM, South London and Maudsley, because their children were receiving treatment. And the other seven carers were accessed by the Peace Pathway Twitter account, so from social media. Um, and I guess this uh, different methods of recruitment meant we had a wider geographical spread. The carers came from all over the UK. Of the carers, three were males and eight were females. Um, six were working. Um, in paid employment, um, three were full-time carers, and two carers had retired from um, paid employment. The interviews lasted 25 to 35 minutes, recorded live, according to the carers' preferences. And the participants cared for family members ranged from 12 to 36, um, mean age of 20. And the carers' ages ranged from 32 to 74, mean age of 59. Uh, Patients had a lot of comorbidities, um, all had autism, comorbid with eating disorders, all were verbal. Um, 10 had anorexia and one was very overweight. Seven also had been diagnosed with OCD. All 11 suffered from anxiety symptoms. Four had been diagnosed with uh, borderline personality disorder. Two had been diagnosed with body dysmorphic disorder. One had been diagnosed with pathological demand avoidance and one with binge purge subtype subtype. So you can see there's a lot of diagnoses there, a really lot of diagnoses that uh, people had. So um, we analysed the data using thematic analysis, and we used the same questions which had been used in the previous study, Adamson and Kinnaird et al., which I've been part of as well. So um, the participants weren't asked directly about the pandemic, but um, quite a large proportion, seven out of 11, mentioned the pandemic and the effect of it on them. Um, we identified the themes and the following five themes were identified. Um, the co-occurring autism and uh, eating disorder, how they interact, the lack of existing support, the impact on carers, how we can support the supporters, the carers and the coronavirus. So in terms of the results, uh, theme one, the challenges associated with um, autism and eating disorders, um, all the carers described difficulties in getting an autism diagnosis for their loved one or their child's autism being overlooked. Um, 
most mostly they receive them quite late. Um, you can see more details about that in the paper when it comes out, it's in review. But there was a kind of perception that delayed recognition of autism caused problems later on due to the lack of appropriate early support. Um, theme two was lack of existing support. So uh, I've mentioned the kind of additional difficulties that these carers would face. Um, and this, I guess the perception of the lack of support seemed to be that their loved one wasn't receiving appropriate support or treatment, and uh, which took into account the complexities associated with their autism. And also they thought that eating disorder services uh, lack knowledge of autism or speciality in adapting care for patients with autism. And one carer described eating disorder services as designed for neurotypicals, doesn't take into account the autism. So consequently, the carers described having to take an active role as an advocate for their child to receive appropriate care. Theme three was impact on carers. Uh, themes two and three were closely interlinked. And in terms of the carers, they had a significant burden of care. They felt that caring dominated their lives and their identities, that it's all consuming. It doesn't leave you time to think about much else. For some carers, this represented a financial impact, including giving up their job to care for their child or seeking private treatment. Um, one carer felt that adapting their lives around the eating disorder in this way kind of reinforced the eating disorder itself. Theme four was supporting the supporters. Carers made a number of recommendations for changes they, helped, they thought would help them support them in their role as carers. And they fell into two categories, improved and tailored treatments for their loved ones, um, which would relieve the burden of care from them and direct support and interventions designed for the carers themselves. So the improved treatments for their loved ones primar primarily focused around eating disorder treatments for needs associated with autism, including more training in eating disorder clinicians, more personalized approaches, accommodating sensory issues in meal plans, including help for carers with meal support in their homes and a 24 seven helpline for autism eating disorder carers. There was also a feeling that in the carers that the people they looked after might benefit from more intensive care, including longer periods in treatment and the provision, greater provision of day or inpatient services. In particular, the carers of adult children and the research felt that um, someone with autism requires long-term care and additional support across the entire life cycle um, as they will face difficulties associated with their autism. And one carer described how their adult son remained dependent on them and would benefit from support around helping him become more independent. And this was a, quite a theme. Uh, it was very difficult for um, the children of these carers to leave home, the older, older children. Um, carers felt they'd benefit from more support from services. Uh, there was an interest in carers' provision of peer support groups and support from others the experience of caring for someone either with an eating disorder only or from with autism and an eating disorder. One carer I interviewed described how she set up her own carers group in the absence of appropriate support, but felt that her local eating disorder service could have done more to help with this. Um, further support options suggested by carers um, included um, psychoeducation, around concurrent autism and eating disorders and services signposting additional sources of help. They also wanted to feel more included in the treatment process and wanted more communication from clinicians to themselves. I think this was the case, particularly where carers were looking after someone over 18, that they felt they were excluded from the conversations and the treatment. Okay, and one carer felt that he would have benefited from clinicians acknowledging and warning him about the difficulties associated with this comorbidity in the process. He would have liked to have known more at um, the time of diagnosis. So last theme is the coronavirus. So as I said, seven out of the 11 participants who were interviewed mentioned the impact of COVID-19 on their lives, the people they're caring for. 
<clears throat> negative impacts included their loved ones' treatments being suspended, disrupted, or moving online, heightening care responsibilities in helping their child's recovery and treatment. The other thing they reported was it was hard to obtain preferred foods and brands in shops due to stock shortages and all felt they were experiencing worsening social isolation. For one carer, lockdown was the most difficult period she'd ever experienced in caring for her child. Um, the pressures of lockdown made it even harder for her to balance her caring role with her other responsibilities. A number of carers noted that in the context of their previous responsibilities, their lives due to caring roles, the experience of lockdown wasn't significantly diff different compared to their everyday lives. Carers were used to coping, taking things day by day. We have um, really bad days and we have better days. So some felt that um, they'd built up a sort of resilience and um, also that, uh, well, we've been restricted. Uh, everybody else has been restricted. Um, that's fair. So, you know, they, they had some strengths from um, having restricted lives. That's two minutes to go now, Madam. Okay, well, I'm not going to have time to talk about the discussion, uh, really, but I think it's fairly sort of self-evident. I'm just going to go through the slides so people can read it at their leisure. It's really the sort of conclusions that people need uh, tailored adaptations for the eating disorder, um, patients who have autism as well, but the same applies to the carers. And I think we're really at the beginning of that. And that for carers, they're very much like peer-based support. They find that very helpful. Um, I think just to sort of finish, um, as I mentioned, I'm a clinician and carer myself. I'm just flicking through that. Um, I think it does give a sort of dual identity. And I started off as a clinician. So I guess knowing all the theories and then Becoming a carer, um, it's, it's something you don't choose, you know, and so I think it's intrinsically problematic, the sort of greater involvement you'll have with your child um, over time. But um, I think there's a lot, I think I've learned a huge amount from the carers I interviewed and the carers I supported, and I feel it's a really exciting field. And um, like I said, if you're interested in reading our book, Supporting Autistic Patients with... Um, autism and eating disorders, uh, please buy the book and um, got a particular interest in um, <clears throat> expressed emotion, emotional over-involvement. Happy to take questions at the end. Thanks very much, Faye. Thanks very much, Madeline. And I've managed to pre-order that book from oh, a well-known online booksellers while you were talking there, <laughs> if anybody's thanks interested. So It'll be delivered on the 12th. Um, that's fantastic, Madeline. Thank you so much. And we look forward to hearing more from you in the panel discussion at the end. It's really, oh, really interesting. Much. Such a rich experience um, that you have being a carer and, and a researcher and clinician. Um, so we're going to take a five minute break now and we will be back at um, 7, 7.40 um, for the next speaker. Thank you. Okay, welcome back everyone. I'd like to just remind everyone that any questions that you have, if you could um, send them through the chat, uh, they'll be answered at the end, um, uh, at the end of the session in the panel discussion or as many as possible will. So send them on through the chat function. Thanks very much. And uh, now I'd like to introduce Gemma Cowan, who's going to give us a lived experience perspective. Gemma is a mother of one, a qualified nutritional advisor, and she's currently studying to teach creative mindfulness for kids. She has lived with an eating disorder on and off since her early teens, and following her son's diagnosis of autism, has been taking steps to seek out her own diagnosis. So thank you very much, Gemma. I'll hand over to you.
Hi, my name is Gemma and I'm going to give you some of my personal experience. So my eating disorder started when I was about 12. Um, I just started secondary school and was all of a sudden becoming very aware of my weight and my appearance. It never even crossed my mind before that. It was also becoming very obvious to me that I was quite socially awkward and that sitting alone, not mixing with the other kids was sort of frowned upon. It made me the target for bullies and I'd often found myself find myself feeling so nervous and anxious around them that I'd go mute. I wanted so badly to be invisible. I absolutely hated school. I'd wake up every morning with a knot of anxiety in my stomach, which made me want to throw up. It was the only thing that seemed to give me temporary relief. I was always complaining of a sick tummy, trying to avoid having to go to school. After a while, the anxiety got worse and I found myself skipping meals. Often binging when I got home, um, but feeling the urge to throw it up again before going to bed. It wasn't long before the weight was falling off me. I started getting compliments from people, which made it harder to want to stop what I was doing. It seemed like a lot of girls in my class were also doing it, so I wrote it off as normal. It was around this time that I believe I put a lot of effort into masking. There was a girl in my class that I really admired, so I started picking up some of her mannerisms, imitating her in order to blend in. I started wearing makeup and changed my hair. She was starting to get attention from boys, so although I was nowhere near ready for one, at 14 I found myself a boyfriend. This relationship was an unhealthy one and left me with an even more strained relationship with my body. The cycle of binging and uh, avoiding eating continued on and off for years, uh, seemingly always triggered by anxiety or whenever big changes were happening and any time I felt a loss of control. The turning point came when I was 18 and I was a few months into my first job. I was very thin and unwell at this time. There were relationship struggles. My boyfriend at the time was heading off to college and anxiety was at an all time high. I found myself in a very self-destructive pattern and was throwing up on a daily basis. I was so unwell that I ended up losing my job. At that time, no one knew I was bulimic. No one knew how much I was struggling. I came across a TV show which featured a nutritionist helping people get their health back on track. And I remember being so inspired by her. It gave me a sense of purpose, something for me to devote my attention and energy to. I really wanted to get myself well and maybe eventually help others too. So I signed up to do a nutritional advisor course. Armed with a new passion for health and wellness, I was able to help myself recover. Of course, the eating disor disorder didn't disappear completely. I still get anxiety knots in my stomach. I still struggle and I'm still learning. I think as an undiagnosed autistic, we really do internalize our struggles. This is why I believe we miss out on diagnosis. This is why a lot of people will have no idea what we are going through. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to reach out and admit when we are struggling, especially when everyone else around us seems to be coping just fine. We start to believe that we are the problem. We believe there's something fundamentally wrong with us. So without the proper tools, um, we find ways to cope the only way we know how. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Gemma, for that and for those very important insights. Um, I, our next presenter is Charlie Babb. And uh, Charlie is a final year PhD PhD student at Cardiff University, uh, researching the overlap between eating disorders and autism, and specifically focusing on how eating disorder services can adapt to accommodate autistic individuals. During her PhD, she has presented her research with the study of eating disorders in, inter in autistic females research group at both national and international conferences. Charlie has previous experience working on an inpatient eating disorders ward under the supervision of the clinical psychologist and has also worked as an autism support worker. So I'm going to hand over to you, Charlie, and we very much look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just share my screen. OK, 
Okay, hopefully you can see that okay. Um, yeah. Um, so, as Faye just uh, kindly outlined, my name is Charlie and I'm a final year PhD student at Cardiff University. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about some of the research that we've carried out over the past few years, which has been looking at autism and eating disorders. Um, and then within our research group, we've particularly been thinking about um, anorexia nervosa in autistic women. Um, and it's so interesting to hear Fee and Charlene's talk at the beginning, um, hearing about their clinical experiences with young, younger people. Um, it has so much overlap with our findings, as you'll see in a minute, um, which is reassuring. And also, you know, some overlap with Madeline's work and um, Gemma's lived experiences as well. Um, so this project is a collaboration between uh, Cardiff University and UCL. And it's called the study of eating disorders in autistic females or CDAF for short um, and I've included mine in the project's twitter handles below if you are interested in following our work. So I'm just going to start with a little bit of background about the two conditions that I'm going to be focusing on today and um, just kind of looking at them side by side. So um, autism is a lifelong neurodevelopmental condition um, and it can be broadly characterized by differences in social communication and interaction and the presence of restricted and repetitive behaviours and interests. Um, but anorexia nervosa, on the other hand, is a restrictive uh, eating disorder, which is defined by a significantly low body weight, um, and also a fear of gaining weight, or perhaps behaviour that interferes with weight gain, and also a disturbance in the way that one experiences um, their own body weight or shape. So when we present these separately, they seem very distinct. However, there's been research that often, uh, research has often shown that as many as uh, 20 to 30% of women who are in treatment for anorexia will also meet the diagnostic criteria for autism. Um, and if we think about this from a more clinical perspective, so perhaps thinking about how um, the effect of this in eating disorder services, um, there's research that suggests that women um, with high autistic traits uh, will benefit less from the current eating disorder interventions than those with low levels of autistic traits. Um, and in a recent interview study, autistic women reported that they have unique needs uh, that are related to their autism that aren't being met by current eating disorder treatments that are available to them. So today I'm going to primarily be talking about um, these two of our research aims. So our first was to identify potential factors uh, that may lead an autistic woman to develop an eating disorder such as anorexia. Um, and secondly, to gain a deeper understanding of autistic women's experiences uh, of using eating disorder services. Um, so I'm going to start with this first aim. And um, what we did was we interviewed three participant groups. Uh, we had um, autistic women who had experience of anorexia. So it's either kind of past experience or current experience of anorexia. And um, parents of autistic women with anorexia and also healthcare professionals who are working in eating disorder services or autism services. Um, and we recruited these participants from all over the UK. Um, on average, the interviews that we carried out uh, lasted around one to one and a half hours. Um, and we carried these out mostly in person, but some also carried out over the phone um, or over video call, depending on the participant's preference. Um, and so in order to analyze um, these interviews, um, we used a method called thematic analysis and this allowed us to develop themes to represent um, our data, to represent our interviews. Um, and importantly to mention, we had two autistic advisors with experience of anorexia who um, commented on the theme development as we were going along. And um, they actually also contributed throughout the project on different, uh, different aspects of the project. Um, and, but this helped us to really ensure that we were um, accurately representing the autistic voice in our, in our themes. So yes, as I mentioned, we're going to be, I'm starting with our first research aim, which was to identify um, the factors in the development and maintenance of, of anorexia in autistic women. Um, and for this one, we, we ended up with six themes overall. Um, these were social difficulties, sensory sensitivities, self and identity, emotional difficulties, control and predictability, and thinking styles. So I'm going to go briefly through each theme. Um, and share some quotes from participants to represent these themes. So I'm going to start off with social difficulties. Um, all the women that we spoke to in these, uh, in these interviews talked about having long-standing difficulties with social interactions. 
Um, and this included difficulties making friends or perhaps um, experience being bullied. Um, and in some cases even told us about being abused. Um, and they described restricting their eating as a way of coping with these difficulties as it would kind of numb the consequent emotion, the negative emotions that they felt from these um, interactions. Um, so I've got a quote here from a participant who said, I think I was lonely a lot after my only friend changed school and that affected it. I could just get engrossed in food and exercise and just forget about everything else. Um, and many women also described that their social difficulties got worse during adolescence. And this tended to also coincide with the onset of their eating disorder. Um, social difficulties also affected their eating as they would often avoid social situations, which also happened to involve food. Um, for example, we can see from this participant here, said the moment when I stopped eating at school was because there was a big canteen, lots of people, lots of social stuff going on, lots of noise. So moving on to the next uh, theme of sensory sensitivities. Um, so this manifested in a couple of different ways. I guess similarly to the previous theme, um, some women described using food restriction to numb um, any sensations that they felt. Um, so for the social difficulties, it numbed those kind of consequent difficult emotions. Whereas for sensory concerns, it was to, to numb sensory overload to things such as, uh, such as noise or light. And many of the women also described they had food specific sensory sensitivity. So this could be to things like taste or textures um, or smells of, uh, smells of foods. Um, and this consequently led them to cut out lots of foods and in some cases also cutting out um, whole food groups. Uh, this participant here said, I've never eaten a tomato in my life. It's just hard and it's squidgy in the middle. It just disgusts me. There's absolutely no way I could eat it. And I'm not keen on lettuces either. The fact it's all mixed up, which in my head it shouldn't all be mixed up. So for me, a salad is actually a terrifying food. Um, I think what's important to note here, and it's something that um, some of the healthcare professionals brought up in their interviews, was that these food restrictions that the women described are very specific to the sensory properties of the food, rather than having a focus on things like fat or calorie content, um, which is something you might more typically expect from someone with anorexia to avoid. Um, and finally, many autistic women told us they had difficulties with what's known as interoception, so the kind of internal feelings within the body about uh, to do with hunger um, and things like that. So this participant here said, I don't really fully understand my thirst and hunger responses or my fullness responses. So that really influences my eating because I can binge or miss meals very, very easily. So due to these kind of difficulties with understanding their internal feelings, this would lead some women to under eat or perhaps rely on external cues such as uh, the time of day to know when to eat. Uh, so I'm gonna move on to the next theme now of self and identity. Um, and almost all the women we spoke to talked about feeling different, so perhaps not fitting in uh, with others or lacking a sense of self. And many of these women actually attributed these feelings to not being able to make sense of their autistic experiences. Um, many of the women that we, we spoke to were not diagnosed with autism until much later. Uh, they didn't receive their autism diagnosis until much later in life, kind of after they'd received their anorexia diagnosis. Um, so some of the women actually described taking on an anorexic identity in order to feel like they fitted in. Um, as you can see from this quote here, I'd never had much of a sense of self, and I think possibly anorexia then became a little bit like an identity. Going into hospital and being aware that everybody has the same condition, you then do become a lot more aware of some of the anorexia traits and you do sort of take them on. Um, some of the women and also parents talked about uh, taking on things like the societal values of being thin as then driving their eating disorder to feel like they fitted in. Um, so I've got a quote from a parent here who said, um, all her life, my daughter had been surrounded by women who would talk about dieting, you know, I wish my legs weren't so fat, all of those things. And my daughter knew that that's important, even though she didn't care what she looks like, uh, but she knew that it's a thing for normal women, for other women, and she wants to be the same. But actually, despite these efforts to fit in and perhaps copy other women um, that were around them, the majority of autistic women still told us that things like body shape and weight tended not to drive their eating disorder, um, which is kind of what you typically typically expect someone with anorexia pap would drive their eating disorder is these kind of body weight and shape, uh, body weight and shape issues. 
So if we move on to the fourth uh, theme of emotional difficulties, um, many women described issues with identifying, regulating and communicating their emotions, um, which led to feeling overwhelmed. So as we saw with the social and sensory themes, women described uh, numbing difficult sensations, and this included difficult emotions um, by restricting their eating or perhaps distracting themselves with excessive exercise. Um, so this woman here said, when I was restricting my eating, I would get this feeling of just calmness. And I know that I'm safer. I know that I'm not going to experience these meltdowns that made me feel embarrassed and frightened. So I was no longer just losing it. So it was really a way to feel calm and control uh, and control the overwhelm um, or like autistic meltdowns like this, um, this autistic woman was, was uh, describing here. And many of these women didn't actually just didn't understand these uh, meltdowns when they were happening because they weren't yet diagnosed um, as autistic. Um, I've also got a quote from a healthcare professional who said, their eating disorder is a way of channeling anxiety. They can just worry about food and nothing else. And that feels much manageable, much more manageable uh, than everything else in their life that feels horrendous. So again, it's about kind of reducing those difficult feelings uh, by becoming fixated or distracted with other activities such as food. Um, so I'm going to move on to our next theme, which is control and predictability. Um, many of the women that we spoke to were aware of their, their need for some kind of control and predictability in their lives. And this is often due to having difficulties coping with change uh, or perhaps having a rigid thinking style. Um, so being able to take control of something in their lives, in this case, their food intake, um, gave them this kind of routine that they, they, they needed. Um, so it was, a it was a really powerful function of their anorexia for many of these women. Um, and some of them told us how it really hindered their recovery. So for example, this woman here said, I seem to have a strong need for control. I would always try and fill with something. And if I could get rid of that, if I could learn to think differently, that was probably the only way I could recover. So I'm just gonna move on to the next theme now, which was thinking styles this is our final theme for this research question. Um, and I touched on rigid thinking and routine in the previous theme, so there's that overlap there. Um, but another type of thinking style that was described by the women was obsessive thinking um, and also things like intense special interests that contributed to their eating disorder. Um, so this involved things like looking for patterns in numbers, um, and this can be kind of through calories or weight, or even actually having a special interest that related to food and exercise that would then kind of feed into their eating, uh, eating disorder. So this participant said, Sometimes I wanted to lose weight because I wanted it to be a specific number because of that number fitting into a pattern or something. So that brings us to the end of our themes for the first research aim. And you can see that all of these factors, um, many of which are directly kind of related to autistic traits, may lead someone to develop and maintain an eating disorder. And we also propose a theoretical model of how these factors may uh, manifest, which is in our research paper, um, I'm not going to go into the details of it now because it's quite complicated and it's kind of easier to see on paper. Um, but if you're interested in understanding a bit more about that, then you can uh, find this paper open access or I'm kind of I'm more than happy to circulate it to anyone who's interested in reading it. So I'm going to take a deep breath and move on to our second research aim. Um, so that's this one here, exploring autistic women's experiences of eating disorder services. So we've looked at the factors that might explain why some of these women develop an eating disorder, um, but what are their current experiences of being treated for their eating disorder? What barriers are they facing and kind of where can we improve? I know that um, Fee and Charlene have kind of looked at this clinically, so it'd um, be really interesting to see how this overlaps with, with their experiences as well. Um, so this is something we asked the same participants as the first study, it was kind of an overlapping study. Um, and we, again, we use thematic analysis to develop these themes. So um, for this research question, we had three overarching themes. Um, and these were misunderstanding autism and autistic traits, one treatment does not fit all, and improving accessibility and engagement within services. So um, this overview is gonna be a little bit briefer than the last one. Um, but onto our first theme, which was misunderstanding autism and autistic traits. Um, this theme describes how staff members in eating disorder services often tend to misinterpret how the women, uh, the women, sorry, the autistic women's autistic, 
the women's autistic traits um, as being eating disorder fueled behaviors. Um, so I've got a quote here from one of our participants who said, when I was in hospital, I kept getting told off for walking on tiptoes and for fidgeting a lot. They thought I was doing these things to burn more calories, except I've been doing them for as long as I could remember. Um, so many of the women actually described these experiences before they had received their autism diagnosis. Um, because as I mentioned earlier, many of them weren't actually diagnosed until a lot later in their life. Um, but some women also were able to describe um, their experiences after their autism diagnosis. Um, we noticed that some women did describe that their, their eating disorder service experience was better after their diagnosis, but actually this tended to be a minority um, and some still felt that this diagnosis wasn't taken into consideration. And some even um, thought that they were kind of too complex a case for, for some services. Um, and onto our next theme, which is one treatment does not fit all. Um, so this kind of thinks about the types of treatment and therapeutic styles that um, these women received their eating disorder. And there were two kind of domains of treatment that were generally felt to be the least beneficial for these women, um, as reported by these women. And these were cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT, um, and therapy that was delivered in a group setting. So traditional CBT was thought to be, reported to be quite inaccessible for some autistic women. Um, they described that it didn't suit their natural way of thinking or kind of didn't, didn't match their way of processing information. And group therapy, as you can imagine, was very challenging for those who had difficulties in, uh, in social situations. Um, so as you can see from this participant here, she said, I'm largely silent in any sort of group situation because I don't know what's expected of me. I'm worried of saying the wrong thing or I worry about misinterpreting people. However, there were some other aspects of treatment that were more accessible for many of the women. Um, they mentioned things like dialectical behavior therapy or DBT um, and occupational therapy. And these things tended to have more of a practical element to them. Um, so as this participant said, we didn't really focus on my eating. They made me focus on emotion regulation and just mindfulness really and social aspects. And that really helped me. So think about kind of emotion regulation and the, the modules that we see in DBT, there was a kind of overlap there. Um, and our last theme is improving accessibility and engagement within services. So this theme largely speaks to two areas of service adaptation that was felt to be really beneficial for these autistic women. Um, first, he was thinking about communication between the autistic women and staff members. Um, and in particular, staff members who were able to adapt their own communication styles to meet the preferences of autistic women were really highly praised. Um, this autistic woman here said, she understood how best to communicate with me. So she gave me written summaries after my appointments. She gave me written information and we used goal setting to help plan my care. So it was really simply, uh, rather than just having this, verbal in this uh, information verbalized to her, actually having it written down so she could process it later. Um, and the second area of service adaptation was more to do with physical adaptations to the environment. Um, so this could be kind of as simple as um, turning off fluorescent lights for therapeutic sessions or being mindful of any distracting noises such as a radio. Um, and just at least being kind of flexible to allow for these adjustments was really important. So that's kind of a quick overview of our study on service experiences. And again, and, oh. Two minutes to go there, Charlie. That's fine, thank you, Faye. Um, so yeah, so again, this paper is also available online, open access, and I'm more than happy to um, circulate it to anyone who's interested in reading it. Um, so to sum up both studies, um, we hope that this research will help to raise awareness of the comorbidity, um, particularly raise awareness in eating disorder services and help them to um, adapt to accommodate autistic traits within their services. And we also hope that these findings will lead eventually to the development of awesome specific treatment for anorexia um, and even adaptations to existing treatments to better meet autistic people's needs. So we know that kind of plays, um, the, the peace pathway, for example, is kind of really on track for doing these kind of things already. Um, so yeah, just a few thanks to finish up. Thank you to the rest of the CDAP team at Cardiff and UCL, uh, to our advisors, Myra and Cathy, and of course, to our participants and our funders at Autistica. 
Oh, and I've included our blog, which um, has a summary of the first study that I spoke about, and we'll soon have a summary of the second study as I'm currently working on it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chai. That was so clear and so interesting and great to have the quotes there from your participants. It really brings the research alive. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so our next speaker is Rachel um, Bosley, who's again going to give us um, uh, her lived experience from her perspective. Rachel is a senior lecturer in psychology based at Bournemouth University. She completed her doctoral thesis at Cambridge University studying cognitive neuroscience uh, at the Medical Research Council's Cognition and Brain Sciences Unit. Her research centres on autism spectrum conditions, particularly around the experiences and mental health of autistic adults. She's been living with an eating disorder for several years when she was herself diagnosed as autistic in her late 20s. So I'm going to hand over to you, Rachel. We very much look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. And I've so enjoyed all the talks so far. So much has resonated with me. Um, so I'm just going to try and share my screen. Hopefully that's going to work. Um, there we go. Hopefully you can all see my see my slides, but please give me a shout if, if anyone can't see them. Um, so I just want to, yeah, I, thank you so much for the introduction. I guess I wanted to say at the start, it's always a little bit strange for me to talk about a personal perspective because for many years I was <laughs> well I'm a, a researcher studying um, the lived experiences and mental health uh, of autistic adults um, I've even published on the comorbidity um, uh, between autism and eating disorders so the way I, uh, the, the normal um, way I give pre presentations is as a scientist. However, I am also a late diagnosed autistic person. So I was diagnosed age 28, um, several years into my eating disorder. And actually I really came to my diagnosis through studying autism during my PhD. Um, I, I learned more about um, the, the presentation of autism in, in girls and women. Um, and that then started to ring a lot of bells and a lot of things became, became unearthed. So I'm going to talk a bit more about that, um, and particularly around the overlap between my autism and my eating disorder. So <laughs> this is a quote, um, and I want to explain the analogy of my title here. There's an analogy I really like when it comes to uh, autism, especially in girls and women. So it's the iceberg. This is a quote that was said by my older sister. It's always one thing after another with you. And what she meant by that was that for years and years, um, there were just things, there were constantly things that were wrong with me. Um, I was doing things or struggling with things, you know, one thing after another. And these were some pretty big icebergs in the swimming pool of our family. Depression, anxiety, eating disorders, um, worrying behaviours like self-injury and suicidality. And so the iceberg analogy is basically if you think about an iceberg, you often see the peaks of the iceberg above the water. And they might seem like separate things. However, you don't see the body of the iceberg beneath the water, the thing that connects all the pieces uh, and, and kind of can explain the whole. And that's exactly what was happening in our case. We didn't know about my autism. So on the surface, it kind of looked like one thing after another. You know, first I was struggling with this, then I was struggling with that, and I was never I was never just okay, um, but actually I had undiagnosed autism and that really, once we knew that, it made sense of all the other problems and difficulties that I'd had. But I think that something that's really important to say and that's really clearly come out in the talks this evening, I, I called my talk the iceberg in our swimming pool because autism and eating disorders are things that happen not only within an individual, but within a family uh, unit. Um, 
And if someone in the family has undiagnosed autism or diagnosed autism um, or an eating disorder and or an eating disorder, it really impacts on the rest of the family. Um, and that can be something that's quite hard to unpack as an adult. So for me, for instance, um, my sister was quite damaged by the attention that was kind of diverted towards me um, and my problems. And so everyone has to live with that later. And there's a lot to unpack. So all the more reason why you want to um, diagnose autism early. So I want to just start my talk by touching on the overlap between autism and eating disorders. So I mentioned this is something that I've done a little bit of research into myself as an academic. And um, we've had these, these fabulous talks about this overlap and some of the features that might make autistic people more vulnerable to eating disorders and features that might mean that once an eating disorder develops, it's harder to break free of. So things like social difficulties, uh, difficulties with emotion regulation, alexithymia, which is um, a difficulty knowing what you're feeling and being able to verbalize that to other people. Having difficulties with interoceptive awareness. So that's being aware that you're hungry and thirsty and that you're tired or that you feel ill or sick. Sensory sensitivities, which can be related to then having really uh, extreme food selectivity. And some people have fears around eating as well, just like the acts, lots of different aspects of it. There's also cognitive rigidity, having black and white thinking. Um, and sometimes this rigidity is sort of turned towards food rituals and routines and numbers and so forth. So I want to now go to my own experience and kind of explain where these factors, where some of them fit in for me. So ironically, um, as a child, um, it was once said about me, she'll never have a weight problem, basically, because um, as, a, as a small child, I had a lot of difficulties with my feeding right from the start. So it was very, very difficult to wean me because, um, well, my understanding just from, from talking to my mother is that this was probably a motor thing. And I, I, I have a diagnosis of dyspraxia, meaning that I'm, I'm very clumsy and very uncoordinated. And what my mum observed was that when she was trying to wean me, I would really get very frightened. Um, I didn't like anything going in my mouth and I, I had trouble manipulating food in my mouth. And if you think about that, that would be quite a frightening thing. So. I was very underweight as a small child. Um, I would eat maybe three things. Um, and as soon as something got added onto my list, something else would drop off. I was quite stereotypically autistic. Um, and ironically, I still wasn't picked up because very little was known back then about autism in girls and women. But um, my family actually thought I was deaf at that time because I didn't respond to my name being spoken, for instance. I really had no idea how to get on with other children or, or adults. Um, so I made a lot of um, awkward social faux pas um, and I really just didn't understand what was going on around me. And so a lot of Gemma's talk really resonated with me because the school years were really difficult. Um, I didn't fit in, but I didn't understand why. And I really didn't understand what was going on around me. Um, I just remember this kind of pervasive feeling of confusion, really not understanding what was going on. Um, and I had a lot of social difficulties. Now, I knew something was wrong with me. I heard my teachers say it. I was taken to a lot of psychologists but no one knew what was wrong with me. However, because I listened to other people talking and I, I heard my teachers saying, you know, this, you know, she's, she's doing this thing, this, this is wrong. Um, I came up with my own hypotheses. So I personally thought I was a psychopath. This arose because I really didn't understand emotions in other people at all. 
So I would react quite inappropriately if, for instance, other children cried. And so I obviously got a very negative response to this. And so I realized that I know, there's something wrong with me. Um, and this was my hypothesis for what was wrong with me. Naturally, you can imagine if you think you're a psychopath, it's not a good self-image to have. And I still had huge issues with food selectivity. Um, so I had very few foods that I could eat and everything I ate had to be drowned in ketchup. Um, we got through so many bottles of ketchup. We were, you know, like basically sponsors of Heinz. We were amazing. Um, and I, I now have the memory and the vocabulary to understand that a bit better. And I know that it was about sensory sensitivities for me and food uh, predictability. So I, the foods that I would eat were highly processed ones, um, like packet foods that are going to be the same every time. So bird's eye waffles, for instance, they're made in a machine, they're always going to be the same. Whereas if you were to, um, say, buy some sausages from a butcher, there'd be one different from this butcher, from, from this butcher, and so forth, all the different brands. And ooh. <laughs> so I really liked things that were, the things that I, I tended to eat were things that were highly processed, very easy to chew um, and to digest. And they were the kind of things that were very fatty. So I did gain quite a bit of weight also because everything was kind of swimming in ketchup. And the really sad thing was that my mother was very much trying to help me um, and took me to dietitians uh, along with psychologists. But unfortunately, these were very shameful experiences. The the message that we got was very much that I was a naughty child um, and my mum was a bad parent. Uh, we weren't trying enough. Just keep trying. She'll eat when she's hungry. Just do not give in. Um, and I just remember the absolute fear uh, when I was sat with this plate in front of me. Um, uh, for instance, if my ketchup had been taken away, I just thought, Ooh. So these efforts were just torture for both of us um, and they never worked. And because I had this, this motor problem, there was always, mealtimes were always a battle because extended family members would always be asking, you know, why can't you use your knife and fork properly and so forth. So I was bullied quite a lot ever since primary school. And a big part of that was about my weight, but, a big part of it was also about my social difficulties. And so my self-esteem was really, really low. And unfortunately, so I don't have a diagnosis at this point. I, I don't have any medical label, but I have a collection of labels. Bad, naughty, weird, loser, gross, so on and so on and so on. Things I'm bullied about. And at some point, my, my self-image is just so rock bottom. I know that I, there's something wrong with me. I'm bad. And that becomes completely linked with my weight. I think actually a good deal of the bullying was actually related to my social difficulties and my not fitting in. But when you're a child, your weight and the, the taunts that children make about your weight are a lot easier to understand. They're a lot easier to grasp. And so my badness at some point becomes very much centered around my weight. And with that is this, this belief, this conviction, if I could lose weight, if I was thin, the bullying would stop, people would like me. And if people liked me, I would be good. So there's a lot of concrete thinking here. And when puberty comes along, that adds an extra layer of awful into the mix as I really struggled um, with a, like a lot of autistic people. I struggled with kind of self-care and hygiene around, around puberty. So there's yet more bullying added in. So I'm put on a diet for the very first time when I'm eight. And around that time, I've already got these really clear ideas about what makes me so bad and unlovable. 
I've got all these cognitions that are really ripe for an eating disorder to develop. But what's really important at this time is that I don't have the means, so to speak. I've got extreme food selectivity uh, and I have a really limited diet of really highly processed foods, fatty foods. So throughout my teenage years, I'm on one diet after another. But if all you can eat are fatty foods, it's really hard to lose weight. You have to basically starve in order to lose weight. So I actually, I do develop a kind of eating disorder, though it's never diagnosed because being me is so intolerable because I know how awful I am. And that a huge part of that is tied up with my body and eating. So it's just kind of diet, binge, uh, bullying, isolation, um, parents divorcing. Uh, and it's all big mess up, big messed up. But I only developed a restrictive eating disorder, a, a diagnosed eating disorder, I should say, um, a bit later on, because to explain my analogy, the way I understand my experience is that I had a lot of the ingredients that could generate a very fierce restrictive eating disorder. That cognitive rigidity, this conviction that the thing that's wrong with me is my weight. And if I could fix that, people would like me. My, my low self-worth, which is really fixed on my weight, being bullied about my weight, uh, using food as a means of emotion regulation. But I cannot effectively diet very well. I'm not effective. Um, because of this food selectivity, until my 20s, I really can't tolerate fruit or veg at all. Um, so all of my desperate attempts at dieting fail, and I'm just in this cycle um, of binging, dieting, self-hate. But when I get into my early 20s, ironically, uh, I work very hard with my mum on overcoming this gag reflex with fruit and veg. So for the first time, I can eat fruit and veg, low-fat foods, and actually enjoy them. And so suddenly, I can diet effectively. I can eat a reasonable amount of something and still be dieting. That's it. That is it. I have all the ingredients and finally I have the means and I am a really good dieter. So all the autistic features come in handy here. I can eat exactly the same thing every day and be completely happy. I literally <laughs> eat the same thing every day and it doesn't bother me. Um, I have all these convictions about my weight being this thing I have to fix. And like other autistic people, my thinking is very fixed, very black and white, obsessive. Um, and an analogy that a friend and I have about our autistic personalities is that we don't have a what we call sod it button. <laughs> so I don't have those moments that other people have when they're on a diet and they just say, oh, sod it, I'm going to break it today. I don't have those. I just am utterly fixated. I diet like a fiend and I just go through one numerical target after another. And so I know that the research suggests for some autistic people, eating disorders are less about the desire to lose weight, low self-esteem, low um, body image issues. Not so for me. And I think a really difficult thing for me is that I started to diet from a higher weight. And therefore, for a very long time, Everyone praised my efforts, my behaviours. Um, for the first time, it was a time of my life when I had friends. I had my first boyfriend and people were constantly telling me, oh, you look great, blah, blah, blah. So why would I want to stop? And at some point, I was at this pretty good stage in my life. I finally had this pretty good social life, but as an undiagnosed autistic person, I, I couldn't keep it up. I became utterly exhausted and really struggled with having a relationship in particular. I found it really hard to understand what my needs were, my emotional needs, um, and also to express those. I was, I am <laughs> the consummate people pleaser. And I came to this place where I felt as insubstantial as smoke 
like a complete puppet. Um, and I remember distinctly having this devastating, what I call a semi semi argument with my boyfriend. What I mean by that is me trying to ask for something to fulfill my needs, him overruling me, me backing down and reassuring him that it didn't really matter. And after one of these instances, I remember sitting on my doorstep in the middle of the night uh, at my student accommodation and just crying and suddenly having this crystal moment of clarity that I don't need to feel. I don't need to feel. Let's go running right now. Not a good idea in the middle of the night as a young woman, but it was actually a revelation. I just got my music. I went off. I wasn't crying anymore. I didn't need to worry about my relationship, my job, my career, my friendships. I could just go running. I could diet. My world completely narrowed to that point where all I needed to worry about was following my rules to lose weight. So very much in line with one of the quotes that Charlie had in her presentation. I was just completely engrossed with my rules about food and exercise. I just had to focus on getting to a number. And then I kept going because that black and white thinking there was no point where there was no point where um, thinness became a bad thing. You could never be too thin. The less I weighed, the better I would be, the, the better, because being thin was equated with being good in my mind. Sorry, Rachel, just two minutes. Oh, Sorry. thank you. Um, so I never thought further than the numbers in terms of what it meant and where it would stop. Um, I had this feeling that bad things would happen if I broke my rules. Uh, in my head, there was no between state between where I was right then and me at my heavier bullied state. So the lower my weight, the further away I was from that previous state and the safer I was. So I would say I was actively ill for maybe three years, chasing weight gain, um, receiving hospital treatment. Eventually I was discharged um, and I stayed at a low but stable weight. Um, very ill mentally, very stuck, very constrained. Um, and the few last years I've been maintaining my weight slowly creeping to a healthy place and last year plummeting again and now kind of back maintaining. Um, and I think the barriers to treatment for me have been very much, as in the previous talks, this cognitive rigidity and for me an obsession with being good. Very, very hard to change this and I couldn't cope with any nuance. So societal messages, as has been previously said, all you ever hear is how good it is to lose weight. And there's this idea that everyone should lose weight. Everyone should exercise. I have no nuance, no, no filter. So these messages were extremely distressing and confusing. Um, and there was also very often this, this abstract talk about recovery. But remember that I have no normal to go back to. My previous state is being in a higher in a higher weight, a bigger body, being bullied, being friendless. Why would I want to go back there? And my behaviours were so entrenched and had been praised for so long. There was also a lot of misunderstanding around me trying to articulate my experiences and my feelings and being mislabeled. So I didn't do very well on CBT or, or cognitive analytical therapy, but these more skills-based approaches like DBT were really helpful. And where we are now, <laughs> so yeah, I'm sort of still maintaining, sort of still in my little fenced area with my eating disorder. Um, and who knows if we'd known earlier, I think that sometimes I think my family might have seen my fixation starting the misattribution of all my problems to my weight and the obsession it became but we'll never know thank you so much thank you so much Rachel that was completely fascinating I don't think I've anyone ever heard anyone describe the journey from early sensory aversion to an eating disorder like that before it's just such amazing insight thank you for that um mm -hmm. So if everybody uh, could send their questions for the panel through, as I say, through the, the chat, that would be fantastic. We're going to have a five minute break now and we'll be back at 8.35 for the discussion, for the panel discussion. OK, so we'll see everybody again at 8.35.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Can I ask the panelists to please turn on their cameras and their uh, microphones and we're going to delve deeper into some of the issues that have been explored in the presentations this evening. I'm going to hand you over to Barry who has collated the questions. Um, he's been doing this behind the scenes for us. Um, so Barry, you might want to take over there. Oh, we can't hear you. Thank you very much, Faye, and welcome back to all of you. And thank you for a very informative evening. And I'll start with two questions for Fiona and Charlene. So firstly, when therapy and intervention don't work, and the only thing that will is the young person making the change themselves, what support can we give, particularly when they present with a demand avoidant profile? Okay, so how I'd respond to that is if the therapy and interventions are not working, we're not doing something right. So we'd need to go back to look again at what's happening and, and adapt our therapy. So I think as clinicians, we're very, um, we're very rigid in the way that we, we work. Uh, um, and that's, that's something that, that I don't do. So I don't work like that at all. I work very, I suppose I'm a quite a, a maverick, bit of a, a naughty clinician in that way. Um, so I will very much be led by the young person. So we don't expect for our, um, I certainly don't expect for my young people to be in the clinic room, sitting, looking at me, expecting them to talk to me. So we'll, we'll do things in very different ways. And I think it's when it's not working and when you've got an individual who is really struggling to to understand what you are asking of them, because it's very easy as clinicians as well, we say that our young people are not engaging with us. That's the wrong way around. We're obviously not understanding what they need or adapting our, our work to, to help them to understand and to change and be enabled. So again, if it's not working, we need to relook at the whole situation and why it's not working. Um, and. And that means the whole holistic thing. So again, it's about really understanding them as a person um, and all that comes with that and be very flexible as a clinician. Now, that's really hard as a clinician because we are under you know, huge scrutiny and, and we all come from very different clinical backgrounds where we have our own rules and our own rigidities. Um, I think we have to be really brave and we have to make sure that our young people that we're working with are, are safe and that we are safe, but actually we can do things in lots of different ways. So, you know, using alternative therapies, using um, modes of communication in different ways. So I have a young lady that wraps for me, that that is her way of communicating. We have another group of young people who use um, equine assisted learning to enable them to connect with their emotions. So it's about, and it's about being brave as a clinician that if you're not if you're not getting if you're not enabling that young person you're not understanding them and they're not being able to move forward you've got to as well fight for and look for other things to help them and you might be their um, conduit for doing that so you might not remain their therapist but you might be um, the person that goes and finds the different therapy or tries to get the money for that different therapy or tries to um, incorporate a different therapeutic relationship. So I think, again, it's about if it's not working, you've got to look more flexibly and you've got to look harder. I suppose me to add to that, because I work in eating disorders, um, an eating disorder approach is very manualized. It's very to the like family-based therapy is a manual, CBT is a manual. Um, and again, I'm a bit of a rebel. So I think it's about picking out the bits that actually may work for that individual um, and they might not work but again it's it's picking out what will work because there's something about listening to that young person or that adult and they will guide you they they have their best understanding of themselves they might not how, know how to communicate it but that's where we're there to facilitate that so to pick aspects out of the models they're there as a guide they are not there as this is what we should do Thank you. So the second question for Charlene, 
Have you come across any resources that help an autistic individual to improve the accuracy of their inter interoception senses? For example, if the feelings of hunger are an issue that lead to restricted eating, missing meals, etc. Are there any techniques or activities that could improve the person's awareness on this that would then help them identify cues to eat? If you are not aware, would you like to col collaborate on this? Um, I suppose um, I, I'm not aware of any resources B might, might be, but I suppose within my own practice, um, it's about we have our own kind of personal relationship with hunger, and then we think that that's what other people's relationship with hunger is. Um, so how I feel hunger will be completely different for another person. So we need to tap in not only to the biological kind of feelings of hunger, but actually the emotional side. So everybody knows me that I get really angry and agitated when I get hungry, but that might look different in someone else. Um, that could be upset. It could be sad. It's all those things. And how can we get that person to identify those things possibly? Um, as, a, as a cue for hunger, not necessarily what we all perceive that hunger may feel like. Um, there's other things that we do do to kind of help again in terms of if they're kind of like their routines, then actually do we need to set reminders and things like that will help. But every person is very individualistic about how we approach that. Um, but I'm not sure if he knows any kind of resources that kind of tap into that more. Um, I know that when we've come across this before, we've done work around, again, the sensory kind of understanding, processing, um, and also about the emotional literacy, again, um, you know, that the kind of link between the physiological feelings and um, the emotional state as well. So a combination of those two um, kind of approaches can help. And again, it's just, um, it's just getting that information to get you to that point to be able to then um, kind of work with that young person on those kind of issues. Thank you. So I have some questions for Madeline. The first question, what do you think autistic individuals are, do you think autistic individuals are more likely to have eating disorders slash disordered eating behavior patterns overlooked and diagnostically overshadowed in clinical practice? You're on mute, Madeline. <sighs> no, unfortunately, we still can't hear you, Madeline. Can you hear us, Madeline? Okay. I might move on to the other questions and we'll try and come back to you. Thank you. So for all the panelists, first question, is it acknowledged by the autistic community that person first language implies that their autism is something that should be separated from the person, but in fact, autism can give them a community to belong to and is a huge part of the, who that person is. So my question is, how do you find the mismatch of language used surrounding autism? And how can we go about using preferred language? Um, shall I start by saying something on this one? Um, I don't know quite uh, the, who, who should think. Um, I would, I'll just say it's a really huge and controversial issue in the autistic community because although the research suggests that of the people who respond to research on this topic, autistic, um, so identity first language seems to be preferred. We're not, of course, talking to everyone and there will always be people who prefer person first language, which is person with autism. So it's a really, really complex area. Um, 
so I guess, sorry, just remind me of the tail end of that question. <laughs> so let me see. How do you find the mismatch of language used surrounding autism and how can we go about using preferred language? My apologies. Um, I guess, thank you so much. I, I guess that um, I, I think you, you come to a difficult area there with preferred language, because as I say, it's so, so diverse. I would guess, I, I would say in my approach when I work within the autistic community is I try to take my cues from them. I try to figure out very early on, if I don't explicitly ask, I try to figure out what their preferences are because everyone will be different. So I think that there's no, I think that we can't say, um, <laughs> yeah, everyone will have slightly different preferences. And I think we have to try and figure out what that person's preferences are and really respect those. And I, I would welcome other people's opinions on that. Uh, just from my kind of perspective, I think I absolutely agree with you. Um, I think it's a very individual thing. And I think as, as clinicians, particularly, we have to be really mindful of the person that's in front of us and what they and be very respectful and um, and knowledgeable about what they what they would prefer. I think it's 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 kind of a, a thing, isn't it, at the moment that we go along with trends and and we don't question those we just kind of go along because we're told oh that's the thing you say now and that's the best thing to say now and that's but actually I absolutely agree with you Rachel it's a, such an individual thing that somebody might not agree with that and and might want to have their own opinion and be very individualized in that so I think all we can do as clinicians is try to be really respectful and I'm knowledgeable about uh, about our young people that are in front of us so um, I agree with you Rachel. the second question for the full panel could the panel discuss adaptation of therapy to accommodate service users with an eating disorder that also have autism i suppose again this, this is a very difficult thing to answer um, because it is again very individualistic. Um, so sometimes, for example, I would have to use the same room with that person. We'd have to have the same layout of that room, be in the same position in that room, um, because then it increases familiarity and increases engagement. Sometimes a room is not appropriate because actually in my CAMS building, the colours on the wall are really bright um, and that can be a sensory overload so we have to think of alternatives um i have gone to homes and actually when you see people in their homes because they're a lot more relaxed they actually communicate a lot better with you and will be able to tell you about their internal world um i suppose in terms of like actual therapies when we talk about the manualized approach and cbts and all those things again it's seeing if that person is the right fit for that because it's very we can apply something to a person that might not work for them and how they think um but it's we can adapt the environment definitely in terms of how we do our processes but and we can adapt therapy within it but not actually we have to really individualize um in terms of family therapy that i we tend to see in our services people always go well, well what's the role of the family then well there's still a role of the family um, we can actually help the parents understand if they get a, a diagnosis of autism, we can help them actually create that environment that will be useful to support them to get back to re-nourishing themselves. So again, it's very individual from my perspective on how we adapt to treatment and therapy models. I think also we have to be really again really brave because I think we have to as clinicians embrace this I think Charlene used a, a wonderful quote once about cross-pollination and working together as clinicians and joining together and using our different skills in order to adapt um, those perhaps more rigid more manualized um, ways of, of approaching 
um, some of the issues that, that we're faced with and our young people are faced with. So again, I, I think it's about, we need to be really strong in our conviction and, and, and our knowledge and our passion and motivation to work much more strongly together and to, to use um, clinicians who are autism specialists and clinicians who are eating disorder specialists to join together much more and then work out ways of adapting and moving away from some more traditional models and, and, and making our new models, our new ways of working based on the evidence and the, the kind of research that's being done now and what our individuals are telling us. You know, we've heard from Charlie's research, et cetera, that, um, you know, and Robin's research that we need to listen. We need to listen to what we need to do differently. We need to join together more and we need to adapt and change. Um, and I know that comes with a lot of issues. It comes with a lot of funding issues. It comes with everything. But if we don't try, then it's never going to change and it, and it needs to change. We know that. Okay, the next question for everyone. Is it also possible that people diagnosed with an eating disorder display higher autistic traits rather than meeting the full criteria for an autism diagnosis? That's what seems to be suggested by the research, yes. Um, yeah, the, the, it's ob obviously <laughs> it's difficult because a lot of people um, with, with the past trends in research and diagnosis, a lot of people have been missed, obviously. So some of those who have high autistic traits might actually be people who should have had a diagnosis, but certainly the research suggests that eating disorders and maybe also disordered eating are higher both in autistic people and in people with greater numbers of autistic traits. That seems to be the, the view from a lot of research. I think it's something that um, Fee and Charlene also commented briefly on in their talk about the kind of effects of starvation. We know that there's that kind of cognitive rigidity that comes with um, not kind of nourishing the body enough and social um, communication difficulties and things like that. So, you know, those kind of manifest and perhaps mimic autistic traits in uh, people with an eating disorder. Um, but then what you do see with a lot of these people is that when once their weight restored, then they might not show um, those, those traits anymore. So that's kind of where they differentiate. Um, and also, I think also what um, Charlene and Fee highlighted was the, was the um, importance of having that developmental history if, you, if possible. I know it's not always possible, but yeah, having kind of um, the history of that, that through the childhood and adolescence, and as well as kind of how they're presenting at the time as well. I think it's also important to acknowledge that most of our research on autism is in childhood boys, um, and there's a gender bias there. Um, so we have a lot more to do to understand autism in young female than woman we're stick, it's not apples for apples in that respect so we have to do a lot more research and understanding there if i might just add another point to that because you're absolutely right and one of the things that's really difficult is even when we do our research um with autistic girls and women we take those generally we take those who have been diagnosed and we know that at present, all of our diagnostic tools are, were designed and based on male, male uh, presentations of autism. So we're actually getting a kind of bottleneck before we even start our studies, because we're only taking those girls and women who have got a diagnosis, who therefore may have a slightly more stereotypical presentation. So it's a huge um, problem, really. A huge problem, and even in eating disorders, there's this real strong gender bias towards females. So you've got this kind of, well, strong gender bias for males in autism and then strong gender bias for females in, in eating disorders. Actually, are we missing something here? Um, so there's lots to do. Thank you. OK, Charlie, I have a couple of questions for you. So. Were the people in your study weight rest weight restored before receiving an autism diagnosis? 
So this isn't something we actually asked our participants. Um, perhaps in hindsight, that would have been a really good question. But um, I mean, we did. So what we did was um, they had a short kind of um, uh, measure of autistic traits um, that we carried out with all of our, our participants. Um, and they all kind of scored within the clinical cutoff range. Again, questions and kind of there might be some um some problems with that because also those those uh those kind of measures tend to be um carried out and developed using male samples as well so how kind of how that might capture their autistic traits might not you know be particularly accurate um so yeah they all kind of but they did all um score above the clinical cutoff using these these measures um and a, a lot of our sample were weight restored when, when we were seeing them a lot of them had kind of um, recovered in terms of weight from their anorexia. So I guess in that sense, there was kind of, yeah, a, a, an understanding that their, their autist, I guess their autism diagnosis was um, accurate, I guess. I don't, I don't want to like question their, their diagnosis, but um, yeah. So, I mean, in hindsight, maybe we could have asked something like that, but because um, uh, that's a really interesting um, question about when do we when do we assess for autism? Can we assess when they're malnourished, or is that kind of going to bring up some some kind of issues with with the effects of starvation and things like that? Thank you. So, question two: Is the link between autism and eating disorders seen across all countries and backgrounds? For example, is the prevalence the same between Ireland, the UK, Africa, and America? this is kind of open to anyone, I think? I mean, it's very hard to say. A lot of the research has been done in UK samples. Um, you've got Kate Chanchura and her team, and obviously Madden's part of that um, at the Maudsley. Um, and we kind of started, or well, I've joined um, with a team at UCL and Cardiff, so very kind of UK-based. And I'm not aware of that many other studies from other countries. I don't know if anyone else is. Um, <laughs> so it seems to be a very kind of UK based sample so far, but yeah, it would be really interesting to see those links across, across other countries as well. And the next question, if an eating disorder is caused or maintained uh, more sensory issues, rigid thinking, routines, number, obsession, etc., as opposed to a more typical presentation of anorexia, is a diagnosis of ARFID more appropriate? And can you want discuss the difference or overlap? So again, that's open to anyone. Um, I'll just say a little bit to start with. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I guess, again, it's a very individual matter. Like for some, like Rachel was saying, her eating disorder did have a kind of element of body image issue, that kind of thing. Um, and that was something that came out in some of our participants just happened that it wasn't, you know, the majority of them said that actually it didn't really play much of a role. Um, and Arthur did come up in conversation a lot within these interviews about whether perhaps in hindsight, this might have been a more suitable diagnosis. Um, a lot of the women that we spoke to um, had been diagnosed with anorexia kind of before Arthur was really known about. It was only kind of introduced into the DSM, you know, less than 10 years ago. Um, and they had their anorexia diagnosis way before that. So whether perhaps in hindsight that might more suit their presentation. Um, and also the other thing about ARFID is it's often, although it can be diagnosed in adults, it's kind of more often seen in uh, younger people and children. So um, there's kind of a, a bias around that, that area as well. So um, potentially, yeah, that could be kind of seen as a more suitable diagnosis for some, for some of the women. Thank you. So Rachel, a couple of questions for you. What advice would you give to those who are supporting an, autist, an autistic person who has an eating disorder? This is a really, really hard question because um, I didn't really benefit from this knowledge when I was in the depths of my eating disorder. So, I mean, I would, I think that books are now coming out which are specifically um, addressing this comorbidity, I think is amazing. So my advice would probably be to, to maybe look into getting one of those. But I would say also expanding on what really helped me, um, DBT and ACT 
therapy. So dialectical behavior therapy and acceptance and commitment therapy. They involve some very foundational skills, emotion regulation, distress tolerance, um, mindfulness and interpersonal effectiveness. So for instance, uh, I had a self-help book, but I also had um, some therapy privately. And it, they helped me develop kind of social scripts to deal with complex situations that might arise in future. Um, visualization strategies when I was when my emotions were very um, out of control, calming. I had a kind of emotional toolkit really, um, and part of that was also around thinking about what are my values. I I think of myself as um, someone. Um, I, I want to be a particular way. So, for instance, I, I want to be a compassionate, loving person. I don't want to be someone who judges other people by their weight. So why do I do that to myself? And so there was sort of this approach of trying to figure out what my values were and kind of using them as um, using them against the eating disorder. Like, why do I want to be some why would I I don't want to be someone who is focused on people's weight and things like this. So these were therapeutic techniques that were quite helpful for me and they have self-help books that are associated with them um but i would really say now these resources are out there for people with eating disorders and autism definitely use them <laughs> um, sounds great thank you so we'll take a couple of more and i think these are open to anyone really so how do we recognize the point when typical food restrictive behaviors in autism turn into an eating disorder it's a good question um i suppose There's a difficulty in this. And services are set up for very clearly defined eating disorders. Um, I have a personal difficulty with this because everyone is deserving of help. So there could be like disordered restrictive eating versus eating disorders. And there's a very set diagnostic clinical criteria to meet that. Um, and it, usually when it impacts um, function of life to a point where it's detrimental on physical health. Uh, that's still very subjective. Um, so it's about individual assessments. I always used to, you, you know, there's, there's going to your GP and asking them to get referred to an eating disorder service um, and getting that assessment and that understanding um, to have that formulation. But I know that people can't get to that door either and that's really difficult um so it's, it's a good question and I wish I had the answer because every kind of service seems to be different on who they accept and who they don't accept unfortunately okay thank you it's been a really interesting to hear about the autistic uh sorry the hear about the autism, eating disorder, comorbidity at different developmental stages. What do the panel members think are the key aspects of the comorbid comorbidity at each stage? I guess I guess I would maybe say something. It's just, um, I think we don't know enough. We know we don't know enough as researchers and clinicians. Um, and so there's lots of individual experiences, but there's a lot, I'd say earlier in life, from my reading of the literature, there's a lot around sensory sensitivities. Um, and I don't know if there's a lot around motor components of eating. I, I, I want to be hesitant to, to, to talk outside my sphere of knowledge but I'm guessing that earlier in life, it might be often you don't have that level of awareness. And so things more fundamental like sensory sensitivities and motor problems might be more of a thing um, earlier in life, as opposed to these, these more advanced cognitions. 
And that's not to say that those sensory things might not be important later on as well. But I think, I think there might, oh, I should probably not say this, <laughs> but there might be a stage early on, you know, before you're, before you're bullied, before you have time to develop all of these ideas about weight and, and so forth, where it's these more fundamental things that are happening. But I should stop here and I really wonder what other people would think about it. I totally agree with you again, Rachel. I think um, it, 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 it's different at each kind of stage, isn't it? And I think you're right. I think when we see our young people when they're year six, year 11, um, that seems to be more around relationships and expectations and education and transition. Whereas when, you know, if we look at younger children and we, we look back in their developmental history, it's more around those sensory kind of issues. Um, so I think it shifts and changes. And I think that's why, again, you know, coming back to it, it's really important to look at all those different stages, because what one individual could have managed in their early development might not be able to manage in their later development because of different ways it's impacting on them. So they may have been able to manage their sensory issues when they were little or their parents managed it for them. But when then there's additional things added on to that, like social expectation, educational expectation, um, peer pressure, that they're, they're all building blocks to add on, aren't they? So I think that kind of impacts as well. Yeah, because I was going to echo what um, Fiona said from where I work and what I see, it's transitions. Uh, so that definitely that kind of moving to secondary or high school. Um, there seems to be a real shift there in the ability to kind of manage that kind of teenage conversations. That's what I see in my clinical practice, because most of our kind of referrals are at that age. Um, so that seems to be something that's kind of popping up for us. Yeah, we definitely get a spike at year six um, when those relationships start to change and and, and, and conversations change. And then we get a spike again, 13, 14, where again, there's the educational shift and expectations and, and different dynamics in relationships again. So we definitely see um, kind of peaks around that time. And for the Irish amongst us, that is sixth class. Year six is the same. <laughs> Took me ages to get around the English education system. <laughs> Thanks for picking that up Sorry. if you'll translate <laughs> so question three then is there any research into how to autistic traits could possibly help recovery from anorexia nervosa i i don't know of any research that's been done but i'm just kind of thinking um anecdotally and through our through our interviews um you know like it's quite interesting. I think, oh, I can't remember who spoke about it now, um, but about you. Uh, so, for example, I'm just thinking about um, rigidity around perhaps routine and having um, rigidity around food intake and things like that. That's something that's often um, criticised in eating disorder services um, is kind of having a really rigid menu. Um, but actually, and I'm not saying it's for everyone, but actually for some of the autistic women we spoke to, having that rigidity was really helpful and helped them to kind of be able to eat um, a kind of, the, the, the kind of amount of food they needed to eat every day. And actually that was really helpful. That was a really helpful aspect. I'm not saying it would be helpful for everyone, but where some non-autistic people might find that really difficult um, to have that rigidity every day and um, have a set menu. Um, for some of the women we spoke to, it was really helpful. So, um, you know, that can then help onwards with recovery. Um, and another thing was around special interests, um, which was a really interesting one because um, a lot of women spoke about having special interests in um, food related things. And it could be like veganism, um, which I know we spoke about earlier and um, kind of environmental factors and things like that, which sometimes could manifest in an unhealthy way, but actually could also help with recovery. So it can really go either way. And I think um, it, yeah, I mean, I don't know what the magic, uh, you know, how to make it go the right way, but yeah, it, there are ways in which it can be, um, I don't know, kind of help to succeed in recovery, um, in my opinion, and kind of what we've I think that's where the therapeutic people. relationship is really important, 
and understanding that person as they have that feeling that they're being understood then actually you can use those traits to help recovery so like I said sometimes they're counting the num sometimes obsessionality means you're counting the numbers down the ways but actually can we use that to count numbers up the ways which is something in, in typical eating disorders you wouldn't dare do but actually this is we need to do things differently sometimes to the person in front of us okay I think that's Probably 10 past nine there, Barry, probably the last one we have time for. Okay, um, I'll, I'll throw in one personally. Sorry, go ahead, Rachel. I'm so sorry. I just wondered if I could share one last resource on that last one. Please um, do. Someone that I've, a professional who, I've, who I know has done some really nice work um, on the comorbidity of autism and eating disorders, an autistic person who has had an eating disorder and who has gone through treatment and who has had treatment adapted. Um, is a lady who has a website. Her name is Pookie, uh, Pookie um, Nightsmith. It's a bit of a strange name. I don't know if anyone else is aware of her, but she's made some videos. Oh, brilliant. She's made some videos. She's got lots of written resources. She's really good. So that's Pookie, P-O-O-K-Y Nightsmith. Um, and she has some really nice resources. Thank you. I think- Barry, you wanna sneak another one in there? I think anyone who works in this area would probably know that name on it. And I suppose a question from my own perspective, when when you go out, say, pre-pandemic and you, you talk to people you don't know and they ask you what you do for a living and you tell them this is your area of work, what's the reaction? What what do people say? Me. Was anyone, that? yeah. Oh. Well, me personally, I... I uh, being an autistic autism researcher is a little bit tricky and a bit <laughs> but um <laughs> but no it, i feel really um happy and honored to work in the area i do and so that's um a real it feels like a real privilege um, and over to the other side <laughs> i just wanted to add that rachel i think it's really important to have autistic people working on some research like it's you know so important so um, it, they're privileged to have you. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I don't know what kind of reaction I get. Um, normally, a, a lot of the time it's people kind of relating actually, like, oh, I've got an autistic brother who has a really difficult time eating or things like that. Um, so it's, and it's it's nice hearing kind of stories of that, but then that they kind of um, can relate to what we've done in our research as well. Um, so it seems that it's kind of a common theme in a lot of people's lives you don't actually know about so yes I tend to get really good reactions um, but also kind of at first like oh okay um, but then it's yeah normally quite positive. As a diet if I say dietitian uh, and usually get the other kind of area where where people say that helped me to lose weight which is not what my um, passion is about is as eating disorders um, and then I say I work in eating disorders and people just stay quiet. Uh, and I think that's because of lack of awareness, um, not sure what to say or what to do, um, which is unfortunate. And I'm passionate about spreading that word. When I say I wrote a book about autism and eating disorders, people just go, wow. Um, that must be difficult. That That is their response. And I go, well, actually, it's important that we get people's stories told um, and that we become more aware of that. Um, so that that's what I usually respond with. Fantastic. Fiona? I was just going to say, um, it's a real mixture, really, because I think a lot of people still don't have understanding and are still a little bit scared about both topics they're quite frightening to talk about aren't they and like oh and um, so they're like oh really do you nice um and then other people are like wow that must be really interesting and um and, and get really kind of engaged in that so kind of two ways really thanks very much thanks to fiona charlie rachel charlie madeline and Gemma, and uh, thank you barry for 
uh, inviting me to chair. It's been a fantastic evening, a really wonderful um, array of speakers and an array of topics. And Madeline, I'm very sorry that you were silenced by technology. It's a terrible shame, but uh, congratulations on your publication. Thank you very much, Faye. And I think the motto we can take forward from the evening, as touched on earlier, just be curious. That's that's what we can all do. I think just ask those questions and use those listening skills. And thank you very much for everyone for giving up their evening. It's hard to believe we're already in March. And a final thank you to Neve Duty, Robin Barlow, Deborah Malone, Jessica K. Doyle, and Laura Walsh. Thank you very much. Nice.